Greetings and welcome to the studio. I'm Harry Fricker, your host. Um, the studio is dedicated to photography, it's the, the online gallery dedicated to photography and culture. Um, if you hear me loud and clear, I'd like you to give me a thumbs up, please. Also, um, if you can, if you can let us know where you're at at the moment, what town, what city, what country, that would be really interesting to know, since uh, we have people from just down the road here to people in Mumbai and uh, people on the West Coast. So yeah, it would be really good if through chat, you actually tell us uh, where you're coming from. Excellent. I've got one thumbs up. That's great. Wonderful. So you hear me okay, that's great. So yes, please tell us where you're, where, where you're in at the moment. That would be great. In Conversation is an inclusive and participatory live stream where you're able to meet the photographers. Um, the studio encourages you to participate through live chat with questions and comments. So we avoid this idea of leaving questions at the end. What we want to do is have something that is far more spontaneous, far more um, freewheeling and your questions and comments will be interlaced woven into our conversation because that's exactly what it uh, what it is so please don't and also please do not hesitate to interact amongst yourselves uh, 20 years 20 plus years of teach teaching has taught me that everybody but everybody has something valuable to contribute to a discussion so do join in it's part of the fun as the studio grows, we're looking uh, to have further exhibitions and encourage you to contact us if you wish to exhibit your work. Another thing that we'll be doing shortly is selling um, artists and photographers' work through the, through the online gallery. So that's a really interesting development and we intend to grow over the next few months. Excellent. So who have we got? Lorna Burns from Bodmin Moor. Hi, Lorna, from down the road. That's excellent. And Sir Desormes, Sir, Sir, Sir Desormes, I can't even pronounce it, sorry, from the south of France. That's excellent. Cool. Wonderful. Okay, without further ado, folks, I'm delighted to welcome Josephine Collingwood author of the groundbreaking book, The Dartmoor Tours Compendium, a truly original piece of work with beautifully, dated, beautifully detailed photographs. And the book, I have to say, that the book is also selling very well indeed. So, Josephine, good evening. A pleasure to have you here this evening. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me. And it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here as well. And uh, I, I want to thank everybody who has uh, sort of joined us this evening to give up giving up part of their Saturday night is uh, um, it's an honour. So indeed, thank you so much. So Josephine, um, tell us about the the, the Dartmoor the Dartmoor compendium, Dartmoor Tours compendium. How did that come into into being? Okay, so I. Um... I'm a photographer. Uh, I sort of retrained um, quite a, few, well, a lot of years ago now, and I'm more used to doing architectural and interior photography, but landscape is what I do for my soul. Mm -hmm. And I live by Dartmoor, I adore Dartmoor, and I thought I will just take more photographs of, of Dartmoor and the tours. And when I went round each one, I, I had a notion, and this was back in 2014, I thought I would like to photograph all the tours. Excellent. And I thought, I like that idea. So I started doing that. And then I thought, but there's so much, and when I read about each tour, there's so much interesting information about each tour. And so the, so the idea for the book came about after that. And so I thought, because I, I, like, I like doing more than just photographs. I like putting together um, written material, graphic uh, material, and so on. That it's part of my background. And so I thought, I'll, I'll just put together this book on my own. And so I started the research. It took me three years in all to photograph them all um, and write the 60,000 words or whatever it was. Um, but it's, it's the research that takes the time. It's reading yes. several sources getting the referencing right and so on. And quite often I would go and visit a tour 
having read about it, take some photographs, come back, start writing, and then realize I've missed 18 other things about the tour. So quite often I went back three or four times to each tour yeah. Um, just to be absolutely thorough. I can't bear being anything less than thorough. Um, of so it took a little while to put together. This was all in my spare time. I was doing uh, other photography, websites, uh, marketing work at, as well. Naturally. And um, finally I got this book to, together and I approached a few publishers. Uh-huh. Um, with a, I did a proposal, uh, as what you do, and, and it shows you it's, uh, times have changed because um, I got a response back from one of the publishers who said, this is the best proposal I've ever seen in my life. Excellent. But they did a, uh, then got back to me a bit later, said, you know, a focus group says um, you'll only sell 400 copies in all, and that maybe, could you do some more color photos? And I thought, hmm. I'm not sure about this. And so I, I, I went back to the drawing board and I thought, you know, I'm going to do this myself. And so I did. And Good. I, I gone down that route. Uh, and it meant I had complete artistic control over every aspect of that book. So I did everything that, you know, obviously the writing, the photographs, the typesetting, the layout, everything, and then got it printed. And I, and I publish it and deliver it out through bookshops and all the rest of it. The, the big sort of book wholesalers still aren't interested because it's a numbers game for them. But yes. it's uh, considering I'm in my fourth thousand now, then I think that shows that they did make an error in that judgment. But uh, it, so it continues to sell. I'm, I'm hoping it will be a, a staple book on people's bookshelves for those who love Dartmoor. So, absolutely. Uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, because in, in a way, you know that your work, to my mind, has echoes of Widgery, the younger, the painter of the Dartmoor painter. Yeah. He, because he had that similar kind of um, approach, that thorough approach of going to these places and painting them in out there in all, in all sorts of weathers. And I think of, of, of all the painters, I think it's Widgery that in a way captures the, 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 the spirit of place, Dartmoor. And I think that, to my view, because I have your book, I went, I went to, the, to your presentation at, the, uh, at, uh, at the Princeton, wasn't Princeton it? The, visit, the, the yeah. Visitor Center, and there was the exhibition, the wonderful prints on, on there. And uh, yes, I think it's your book that, in a way, is, is, is comparable to the, and more, goes into greater detail than the work of, of Widgery. And I, li- I like yeah. Widgery quite a lot. Oh, look, we've got a comment just come through, through Lorna. The book is beautiful, and the interesting facts are just the right length. Well, that's great to know. Thank you, Lorna. Yes, yeah, I, I totally agree, definitely. Thank Excellent. You, yeah. So, how about, uh, could we see some photographs? Uh, well, the photographs I've got, uh, uh, the ones that I put on the exhibition are, are all taken from that, um, yeah. from, from the book mostly. Uh-huh. But uh, I do have some other uh, images that I wanted to sort of share just to talk about um, what sort of floats my boat in terms of Dartmoor photography. So, Excellent. Um, do you think you could share your screen again? I will, I will. Uh, so I just wanted to introduce this is, um, let me just do the window there. This, this is uh, from the exhibition, from the, from the book, it's, uh, Brack Tour, which is, and talking about William Widgery, it was him who uh, got that cross made on top of Brack Tour right. uh, for Queen Victoria's Jubilee. Um, but, so the image, it, I've included it because it's, I like playing with clouds. I know that sounds slightly ridiculous, but I think the sky is such an important part of an image Sorry, I need to see you. I can't see you here. Um, that it often gets forgotten. And yeah. I think waiting for the right clouds, formation or clear clarity is hugely important. And I get, I take it to an extent where I find myself saying, that's just like the rock. And I'll position myself so that the, the clouds sort of reflect what's happening in the rock. Because I do love rocks. It, it's... Yes. Um, <laughs> a characteristic of mine and uh, I do take up an awful lot of photographs of rocks so um, and a lot of black and white photography but then we, we can talk about black and white later but so I'll just sort of scroll through uh, some of these pictures which are a play a play with clouds I 
I, yeah. I love that. Can, so. can I can I just say that yes, it's it's the layer the layering the of layering, the of yes. the granite underneath the yes. the, 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 the cross. The yes. Exactly, and so, the clouds above they echo one and, and, and the other, and also the ones on the side. Absolutely, yeah. it's wonderful. So that, that's that's what I enjoy doing. So this one's leading tour, and I just noticed if you see the the top of the tour yeah. has this profile, and I just thought I just yeah. saw it in the cloud. I I, I see echoes. A yeah. lot in, in things and uh it's wonderful. So that, that was another one um what else have we got a uh, great staple tool all yeah. the sort of la laminar clouds there and yeah. the little quirky stone in the middle yeah um this one i like this is uh, a stone circle bronze age three or four thousand years old yeah. the clouds above created this sort of crown that almost That's echoed. amazing ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。ですね。
because that's dull as ditch water. So you, you just, yes, you choose the right day and, and hope you get lucky. If not, you go back. So Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Um, another question um, from Sarah. Um, are you more interested in the clouds or the rocks? <laughs> mm, rocks. Sorry, yeah. The, the clouds come in, you know, second or third, but yeah, I have to say, my background is geophysics and geology, and so I have this affinity for rocks. I find them fascinating. I climb them, I photograph them. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for that comment. Um, yes, rocks. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think, for, for, for especially for people that are not familiar with, with, uh, with the geology of this neck of the woods, am I correct in saying that the granite is around 500 million years old? Uh, no, it's, okay. it's actually about 285 million years old. Okay. Uh, but so, which is quite... Quite old, but yes, not as much as uh, some of the rocks you get in uh, upcountry, really. But it's it's quite unique in the uh, in the UK and certainly in the world. It's got it's probably it's recognised as one of the best um, periglacial landscapes in the world to, for studying tours and post ice age action on rocks. So yeah, it's very special. Absolutely. It creates its own soils and ecology as well. So it's not just the rocks, it's, it's what grows on it and therefore what grazes on it and and so on. Yeah. Of course, it's the whole ecosystem around it, isn't it? it? Because it is. it is the rocks that determine what will grow, what won't, how the water flows, etc., etc. Absolutely, yeah. I've just, yeah. Um, I'm working on a new book on the geology of Dartmoor and, and photographing different aspects of the of the rocks and so on. And I'm, I'm just studying the rivers at the moment. And um, it is fascinating. So, you know, the whole, the whole blob of Dartmoor actually started off tilting east and then tilting south. And all the river systems have all adjusted for that, you know, to uh, compensate for that change of... Um, tilt and you look at the river you know i've drawn out and traced out all the rivers it's just it's just fascinating fascinating amazing but, but because the rock is so homogenous you get this beautiful dendritic system of rivers of course absolutely another question um or rather a comment from lorna the black and white is beautiful and atmospheric but dark or has beautiful, beautiful colors color. It does. I will come to that. I, sh sh if I finish my, my little cloud section, I will go to colour, if I may. Because Wonderful. I yes, well, 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 we, well, yes, I think it's a great idea. Okay, so um, so this, back to the, uh, this one, this is North Hestry Tour. And for me, in my strange world, I feel you can see the lump of rock that's just fallen off um, because it's a slightly different rock, it's an aplite of um, sill, but it's fallen off, but it reminds me that the hole in the clouds, uh, back to the clouds, it looks like it's something's fallen out of that as well. I know that makes me sound completely bonkers, but I like the, the sort of echo of space in the rock, creating a shelter and in the clouds. So, um, so what else have we got? Next one. Here we go. This isn't Dartmoor, but this is, uh, I, I've clumped together some sort of general other landscapes that I, I sort of quickly looked at. and. Um, this one is an interesting uh, image of mammalian clouds. They're really quite rare. Um, a snowstorm in the Brecon Beacons. Um, uh -huh. And it was extraordinary. Um, and moving on. Oh, my favourite. The ultimate cloud is the Aurora Borealis. Oh, wow. And I was lucky enough to go to the Foden Islands a few years back and uh, drive out at midnight with a friend starting to look and the most glorious show started. Um, and I was there with my tripod in a huge puffer. It was freezing cold, jumping up and down um, with delight. It was absolutely astonishing. It was, you know, such a sort of spiritual moment. So. Um, so here we go. There's colour in colour is so important. So the colours in Aurora Borealis they relate to the specific sort of uh, gas electrons um, to create the different colours. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, so uh, that being 
the clouds, let's go to colour and Dartmoor. So a classic, everybody does Wisman's Wood, I know, but you have to do Wisman's Wood because A, yes. it's ancient, it's one of the oldest, one of the three oldest uh, ancient woodlands on Dartmoor. Uh, it is green. I mean, green is calming, it's, it, it's earthing, and you go there, you are surrounded by green. You, can't, you, you just can't get angry in, when you're surrounded by green, I don't think. Um, it's got uh, an astonishing range of uh, ferns and lichens or lichens, I don't know how you say it, mm -hmm. um, which are world leading because the air is so clean there, but it's, it's gnarly, all the oaks are old, they, they're tangled. It's very, um, very special place, which has suffered of late with too many visitors, but um, it's still extraordinary. So, so here, even though black and white would work for me, it's it's green. It has to be green. So yes, absolutely, it's because it's 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 so unique. And on, on that note, we've got another question coming in. I would like to ask if you ever had any spiritual experience in the haunted places. Thank you, Pavi. Hmm, that's an interesting question. No, not in haunted places. I'm not sure about places being haunted. I think places have echoes and a feel um, and on Dartmoor I, I I'm just you're just out there with nature which doesn't frighten me ever um, I you know I, I walked across Dartmoor on my own at night it's it's not it doesn't frighten me uh, the forces of nature frighten me but not nature itself so I don't think there are any particularly spooky places um, but being out there and when you're feeling uh, trapped or troubled, if you go out in nature, in a wilderness where there's no other um, sign of people, you instantly feel better and it's, uh, you know, you get c connected more with your inner self and I think that is a, mm -hmm. is a spiritual experience. So yes, and very often when I'm in different places, and new places especially, there comes a moment of pure fluttering joy inside where you just have to say a little thank you to whatever, mm -hmm. Mother Nature, Gaia, whatever, mm -hmm. and just, just say, well, that is just beautiful. And that's when I would I would take a mental photograph and think, that's beautiful. Then I'd then take a, try and take a photograph if I can. Um, and that's what drives me, actually, is to photograph what I see rather than go out and specifically look for a photograph. Because that's what I used to do for a living. I had to get photographs of buildings and houses and room sets and so on. And you have to come away with the best photograph you can, given that set of circumstances. So when I'm in nature, I choose not to. I don't plan so much as I go and see what I can see. And... It, you know, with photographers, I'm sure, as, as you all know and have, you have an eye, you see things differently. You see colour, you see light differently, form, shape, composition. And so I'm sure you would all agree you can go out, walk and just say, wow, now there's a photograph. And you try and take that photograph. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But, um, Absolutely. It's more of a feeling, isn't it? It is. Yes. Absolutely. We've got another question here from Ali, Ali Holland. Do you have a favourite time of the day to take photographs? Do you find there is a better time to capture cloud form clouds, formations, light? That's Ali, thank you. That's a good question. Um, I have to say right here, right now, I am not a sunset or a sunrise person in that <laughs> I will go out. No, no, I will go out in those times, but I... Forgive me, I cannot bear sunset shots of Dartmoor. I cannot bear them. Because it's like using the light as an excuse. It's like, look at it, isn't this pretty? Because there's a sunset. I said, no, no, it's it's glorious. It doesn't need a sunset. So I find the, the middle of the day is a harsh light. It tends to be very high over you. And it, you know the, the shadows are very vertical. So it's not ideal, but morn I love mornings. I think mornings are the best time for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the the colour of the light's different. It's it's fresher. So yes, um, 
but actually it depends what you want to do. If you're looking at color, pure color, it's actually better to go when there's a, a, a cloud cover because then it acts like a giant soft box and you get the saturation of colors really, really sings out. Um, I used to think, years back, I used to use Velvia film. I don't know if uh, other people remember that. Velvia 50, Velvia 100. And it was known for its nature colors and greens and reds and that, but particularly the greens. And um, you, you choose a, a sort of slightly overcast day, not overcast, but just a sort of gray day that's bright is perfect for bringing out color. Um, but in terms of yeah, formations, you need a bit of sunshine to actually get some shadows and bring out the texture. So it kind of depends what you're taking the picture of. But, but good question. Absolutely, thank you. Should I go on with some of the more color? Yes, please. <laughs> okay, so what have we, so we've, we've done, gosh, I've done to death. So this is Grenfell, more green, I'm afraid, but yeah. it's uh, green with a little bit of um, that sort of blue white of the water. So a, a long exposure. I'm a bit of a sucker for it. I know it's a bit cliched, but uh, um, I find that the, the River Walkham at Grenfell is a, is a big pool. Um, <laughs> I love trees too. Um, just a grand, grand old tree at Postbridge. I keep seeing this one um, in the car park and keep going back to photograph it. Um, it's beautiful. Wow. Well, that has to, I mean, it, it's got to be colour, hasn't it? I yeah. mean, it, you know, there's hoarfrost on the trees. This is four winds uh, on the way between Merivale and uh, the Princetown turn off. Um, used to be an old school to. Uh, the students, uh, fog and, um, yes, fog and tall, swell tall quarries, and yeah, beautiful hoar frost. The sun's just starting to warm everything up. There's a little bit of mist. Every kind of rainbow colour you can imagine there in subtle mm -hmm. form. I love that. Um, iPhone, just an iPhone, will do that. Um, wow. So you don't need super high tech cameras and so on. You just need to watch and see. Um, what else? Oh, so I was trying. I was illustrating the book, and this nature has its own way of of producing complementary colours. So the sort of magenta and lime green, they're the perfect complementary colours. And actually, if you look hard enough in nature, they're just everywhere. Um, and I think it's very clever. This is a sundew, uh, which is a sort of carnivorous plant, which you find if you look down deep enough in the bog floor of Dartmoor. That's what you come across. Um, uh, <laughs> outrageous fungi again just on the moor I mean redder than red and fire orange has to be in colour um, definitely so back to sort of subtlety so the rivers of Dartmoor are quite, quite unique uh, just be, they, they, they tumble and fall over great boulders brought down from post glacial waters and so on but I love this photograph uh, only because of the green it's nothing without the green. Mm -hmm. And to me, that just anchors it. And I just love how everything's falling out through that sump and out to right. But again, that's just me. I like that one. So th this is Knack Mine in the middle of the moor, North Moor. It's a very remote place. Now, that I know that probably looks like quite a dull picture. But I absolutely adore it because of the colour, the subtleties of the colour. I can see the... The moss greens there and the sun backlighting all the tussock grass. And it's creating these soft hues and a, with a little bit of frost, tiny smattering of snow. Uh, to me, it just it's just the essence of what the high dark moor is like. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yes, yes, yes. The subtlety is, 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 is so, so, it's intense, it's isn't it? Uh, look, this one, I just call them blue sheep. The, they all, it was cold, cold morning near Princetown. I saw these sheep huddled against the wall and I thought, you just look like a bit of the sky. <laughs> Again, it's another echo. So they posed for me quite well. And uh, I just, I, yes, I just love the blue sheep. Um, down at near um, south, south of the moor, just mosses, lichens and so on. The, the colour of this lichen it's absolutely draped in it and it's such a subtle color and if you look behind it there's that kind of magenta color which actually is quite a, in the autumn quite a, a lovely complementary color for it so again it, quite dull but you know these, these things please me 
um, subtle colours again, but colours absolutely necessary, this sort of steely grey. Uh, this shows the, um, uh, what do you call it, the stripped away nature of Dartmoor, how it can be quite a harsh environment, it mm -hmm. can be cold and so on. And I just love the contrast, the shapes and the echo of this sort of steely blue grey at the foreground and then the sky. Um, the colour is absolutely crucial to that image. Absolutely. And, and, then, of course, and then, of course, you get, when you don't need colour at all, when you want to show something else, not Dartmoor, I know, but uh, so these are the sort of Southern Alps. And to me, there was a storm with snow showing. It was the, the, the textures in the mountain with the, with the soft clouds behind. It was just drama on a stick. I absolutely love that. Absolutely. And then, here we go. I am, I'm breaking my own rule. This is um, a sunset on Dartmoor, but I couldn't help it because I've never seen crepuscular rays quite like it. They're absolutely yes. extraordinary. Yes. Uh, walking with friends, it's actually on an exercise, and uh, look back, that just faced with that. What are you going to do? Of course, you're going to get your iPhone out and take this photograph. So, absolutely. Um, right. Forgive me for breaking my own rule, but that was extraordinary. Absolutely <laughs> extraordinary. So, uh, Good. Why not? Anyway, so, I'll, I'll stop sharing on those. Um, cool. But I can, I can also, I can go on to, um, I, I've got a few infrareds if you want to see what they look like. Uh, I'm sure that so, would be very I, interesting, yes. There's only about three or four. There are ones that I've scanned from before, but I, it just shows you the nature of them. Um, Excellent, so let's yes. up, Share the screen. Yeah. Okay. Can you see that? Yes, there there, it's wonderful. So it's very, very grainy. By definition, it's just grainy because uh, the, the nature of the celluloid film um, means you get a, a large grain. The grains are actual silver halide crystals. Um, so you see bright, this is spring, beech trees, Sanford spiny. So the, the bright green of beech leaves just comes across as white and then the blues are, just don't really register. So the deeper the blue, the blacker it is. So um, it's it's quite a unique effect and quite sort of dreamlike. Yes, it's um, so, so ethereal it's in a way. It's it, especially in the in, in in the the, the 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 line in the background of that last photograph, and it's all quite hazy in a way, and it yeah. literally is almost like a Very, yeah. like yeah. a painting. It's almost impressionist. It is impre impressionism, isn't it? It is, yes, it is. It's, it's extraordinary, I know. Um, this is a Fernworthy Reservoir. Uh, again, I just like the line of the, 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 the edge of the water, the curve, and so on. But uh, you, you absolutely have to have white, fluffy clouds and blue sky to bring it out. So I'm, I'm still sort of learning on this one, but uh, you can see the sort of grain. You get reticulation quite often, so it can, you know, it can break up a little bit too much. But, and of course, when you're looking through the camera with an infrared film, you can't focus as you normally would um, because you can't focus on that part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So you actually have to adjust it back um, to get the correct focus. We have a uh, comment by, by, by Paul and Kate. Love the trees. Amazing effect. Oh, good. <laughs> um, I like the spelling. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so uh, again, another one of Dartmoor, but so, you know, on days where you get uh, a line of clouds um, near a horizon, they'd be perfect for infrared film where you get those sort of deep blues return to black and then nice fluffies and different shapes. You can see the grass and the, the pine trees along the uh, horizon, they're just, they're just almost white. Um, when people do illustrate sort of ghost films and books, they always use infrared photography because it just looks quite ghostly. Um, and then the last one, this is actually uh, Postbridge. And here you can really see how the, the, the green in uh, the plants just, just shows as white on film. But there's just enough information there to work out what's going on, but everything else just goes dark. So it's, it's, a, you know, it's an acquired taste really, but that's what informed um, inform my uh, you know black and white photography or influenced it I should say 
uh, that and lith printing. I used to do a lot of lith printing, which is, uh, a, again, it's a darkroom process where you, you use certain chemicals so that it creates a chain reaction and you have to pull it out 10 seconds before you think it's ready and, and watch it just happen, even though you're trying to stop it. So anyway, mm -hmm. um, I'm now it's, withdrawing. It, 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 no, it's interesting because what, what you're showing, it's interesting because the, 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 the post-bridge photograph, the last one we saw, um, I've seen that photograph <laughs> thousands of times at all sorts yeah. of variations from every at different times of the day, different angles, you name it, they've covered it all. But that one is different. That's almost literally yours. You're not literally seeing a different level of reality. It's another reality yeah. that we're actually seeing there. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. it's Which is, in, in a just, way, it's, it's almost ghostly, I would say. It's this kind of ethereal, yeah, there yeah. but not there. Is, is it real? Yeah. Is it yeah. imagined? It's, it's, it's a metaphor, yeah, it's, isn't it, almost? It is, yeah. So you're looking like, it's like you're looking through somebody, uh, you know, another universe eyes or somebody else's eyes in a different universe yeah. or something mm -hmm. like that. But, mm -hmm. yeah, I suppose we are, really, because you're looking at different wavelengths, but, yeah. Well, yes, quite a different reality indeed, sort of different wavelength, absolutely. Um, so I can, I, I, the last lot I've got, I believe, uh, is I, I've got a few abstracts to show if uh, people want to see that. Um, mm, yes. So abstracts, I, here we go, an abstract and it's rock. How happy am I? Um, <laughs> I... I suppose perhaps I'm a frustrated artist or something because I love just um, impressionistic work that's just the right combination of of pattern, colour, and so on. And so when I see that in nature, it it makes me want to pick up some form of camera. So anyway, so I'll, I'll work through just a few um, abstracts. Oh, so this is just a marvelous crack. I mean, look at it. It looks like. Um, the uh, roof of the Sistine Chapel with the crack of um, going from one hand to the other, God to whoever it was. Anyway, it's um, wonderful. Filled with little stones, um, good detail. Because so, it's uh, disconcerting. Well, the, the, the sense of it, there's a, we, we kind of get lost in a sense of depth yeah. there. And it truly well, is. Like. It's like looking into another world. Uh, yeah. It's like, I, that's why I want to do more macro photography when you're looking mm -hmm. deep into, you know, moss beds with all sorts of other mosses and creatures and fungi and, and lichens and all sorts of things. It's like a, a forest in its own right that if you can get down there into and it, it's like a, a fra well, okay, so I'm going to bring this up again, fractals where you see the world in different scales and you can bring it down and down in here. I just want to start exploring inside those cracks. Yeah. You know, like you would uh, a pothole and caving and so on. So, um, so talking of sort of a practical idea, um, this isn't a particularly good photograph, but it, it just yeah. illustrates, I just love the repetitive patterns within nature. Um, the Fibonacci sequence, uh, fractals, where uh, they all can be defined by mathematics. And it, the, mm -hmm. using the sort of understanding the science behind it does not diminish in any respect the... Uh, fascination and the beauty in these things. In fact, I think to me it enhances it because you get to appreciate how good nature is at designing things. So, um, so moving on to just just weird abstracts. I mean, what cool lichen on a on some wood. Um, wow. Just this bright lime, limey yellow green. Just uh, something and nothing. Uh, it, it it's. Well, yeah, you'll, you'll see similarities. It's, quite, it's um, beautiful. Yes, of course, and it's echoed there as well, that, that, that linearity. Yeah, yeah, yes. A bit of a sequence, but just uh, a bit of an abstract. But I, I love new growth, old growth. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, you know, burnt trees, uh, forest from a, you know, a wildfire, new growth coming up. I love that fresh green against that dark. It tells a story in itself, as mm -hmm. well as being visually you know interesting mm -hmm. <laughs> just leaves on the ground i mean i can imagine that on a wallpaper yes it, it, um i know it's just earth and leaves but the perfect randomness of it is just deeply pleasing for me mm -hmm. um 
uh, go in really, really close, you just get abstracts of an entirely different sort of nature. And the, the subtleties uh, excite me. Um, I'm not really a pink person, but I think this, the pink in this is just extraordinary. Stunning, um, absolutely. So, so it's more, back to more, what, what sort of floats my boat, I, ice sculptures, uh, crystals, mm -hmm. extreme, um, weather effects you get these furry rocks up in the hills and um, they fascinate me I could spend hours photographing that if I wasn't freezing so uh, so we got a, a, I think a couple of these oh so ice I mean how fascinating is ice the patterns you get so this is uh, just a puddle Let's bring it down smaller yeah just it's just a puddle, but again, that to me could piece of, be a piece of art. Well, it is a piece of art. I just Absolutely. photographed it. Yeah, it could be a uh, painting by the German artist Escher, mm -hmm. with the staircases um, yeah. going in different ways. But again, it's 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 the fractals at work, um, Fibonacci, yes. the golden mean, you know, <laughs> the sacred numbers, yes. you know, all all that at work. This is fantastic. I love this They're shift of gear so. from the landscapes where you started oh, to, to this work here. Yeah, this is really it? interesting. Yeah. Um, anyway, so uh, more puddles, more icy puddles, but mm -hmm. they are infinite fascination to me. And this one I love. It, there was about a foot gap underneath that. It was literally just suspended with gaps in it and then just... Um, it, you know, hollow underneath. Absolutely extraordinary. And all the same sort of angles and all the, the massive ice crystals. It fails to fascinate. Wonderful. Um, so this, <laughs> um, you see, I, I would have that on my wall. Yes. Uh, you know, I didn't produce this. I just saw it. It's actually from a burnt out car and it was taken on my iPhone. But I think... I would buy that as a piece of art, I think. Yes. You know, the natural process of burning through, I don't know, enamels, paints, metal, throw in a bit of oxidization and you get a piece of art. But nature's the artist rather than mm -hmm. some person. So, again, similarly, it's a burnt out car, but it could be, it, you know, it could be modern art. This is, I, I don't know why I threw this in, because it reminded me of it, but I just, um, a bonfire night, just trying to capture flame and the, the, the it's almost like starling murmurations yes. of uh, sparks. Uh, I think, I don't know anybody who's not fascinated by flames and to try and to, to see these sparks sort of fly around is, um, I find deeply satisfying um and now okay the ultimate abstract i saw this in a, in a city i know it's bizarre but i saw that i thought well that's a christmas tree that became my christmas card that year and it's just pure random luck yeah. that this paint peeled underneath there was this fabulous fabulous greens but i'm i'm, I'm hoping i'm not the only one that sees a christmas tree there because i am then definitely a christmas, christmas tree there's no two ways about it <laughs> Shion, so uh, <laughs> but so that's that's all my abstracts and probably all I've got to, to sort of show you now. So uh, you know, I I can now just talk, but I haven't got anything else to show. If anyone's got any other questions, so well, there, to... there is a couple, uh, an earlier one from Lorna. Do you know how clitter was formed? I do. <laughs> Um, the long story, the short story, um, clitter is basically bits of tor and bedrock that have been broken away through freeze thaw action from post-glacial time. So, so the, the Dartmoor tors were affected by, were eroded actually under the ground as well before they were exposed, but when they were exposed it was accelerated massively and um, the freeze thaw action would just prise apart the blocks and these blocks would then fall to the ground and then with solid flaction where you get um, a repetitive sort of thawing and then things would slide slightly and then freezing and then they'd move down and so on. You, you get these sort of fields of clitter as all the debris works its way downhill and any indentations you start to get little clitter patterns and so on. So. Uh, 
yeah, it's basically bits of tor, bits of bedrock that have come apart and been transported by gravity and nature. Cool. <laughs> Another Great question. Great geology question. I like that one. <laughs> Indeed. Another question from Ali Holland. So what is more important to you, the composition of the photograph or capturing the, capturing the sense of place? That's an excellent question. Mm -hmm. uh, it depends what I'm photographing. The sense of place, I would say, is probably more important. Um, composition, that just comes, uh, you know, if you're a photographer, or even if you're not, but it's an instinctive, what do I want to show? What story do I want to uh, give? But the sense of place is, is definitely the, the, the overriding factor. And the composition just has just has to be instinctive, I think. But good question. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes, it's about capturing that. It is that sense of place in a way. Somehow that it's almost trying to articulate the feeling, isn't it, of mm. being there. Excellent. Cool. Any other questions, folks? Any other comments? Questions? Please send them. Send them in. So. So what is your next project, uh, Josephine? Um, so as a, at, the, at the moment, I'm, I'm working on a geology book, um, mm -hmm. which I know is a, a bit of a, uh, away from photography, but it's, uh, you know, it, it forms part of it. I'm, I'm, I've been re-inspired recently to get back out there. I love going out with my camera on Dartmoor and taking photographs for the sake of it. So mm -hmm. what I want to do is do a whole new album, if you like, of photographs, um, possibly for, you know, with a view to an exhibition, but I'd love to be able to do them with soundscapes. I'd love to do like a synesthetic sort of amalgamation of place and sound together. Um, ah. Because again, sounds fascinate me too. So, uh, you know, I'd love to photograph somewhere, get that sense of place, but also record five minutes of exactly. what it's like to be there, whether it's listening to water trickling through moss to yes. the wind coming through the soft rushes on the high moor yes. babbling brooks skylarks whatever you know so that's what i'd like to do is just sort of bring together sort of two senses but um on the back of photography so Absolutely. Yes, but I'm going to get this book out of the way first and then... Yes, <laughs> indeed. Uh, yes, so it's, it's interesting because then it begins to be more multimedia, for, certainly spearheaded yes. with photography, yes, but yeah. in, 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 the, in the background, in the, in the long tail, is video, audio, um, maybe time-lapse or something along those yeah, lines. Time-lapse is fascinating for sure. There's yes. these photographers that have done time-lapse on Dartmoor and they're extraordinary. They're brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, yeah. We have one question from Lorna. Do you use 35 mil or are you digital now? So, um, the I'm digital. I, I, I grew up, if you like, on film um, and it was medium format for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. uh, I used um, the Mayers and then Hasselblad film cameras, uh, then went to Hasselblad Digital, and now I'm on Nikon Digital and iPhone. I know I keep banging on about this, but I, I want to get across to people that you don't need fancy equipment to get photographs of depth, meaning, and uh, longevity. Um, so yes, I've embraced digital. It means there's a lot less time in the dark room, which you know would get tiring, um, especially with color work. That was that was really quite time consuming and messy. And and now you know dark rooms aren't terribly environmentally friendly in terms of what you know the chemicals mm -hmm. that you have to use and so on. So digital, I just spend more time on my bottom at a screen now than I do in a dark room. But then that's fine. Uh, it means I can. I have a fire behind me and the dog next to me and so on. But, uh, yeah, I, I cut my teeth on film. Um, I've even, I, I still have a plate camera actually, a, a Horseman five by four inch negative oh, wow. film camera where you get the black hood, the work. So ultimately you'll probably see me doing a, you know, in my dotage, I'll be wandering around Dartmoor probably with a mule with all this gear on the back, a bit like Ansel Adams. Smoking a pipe or something, I don't know, um, taking photographs, just pure black and white, just for the hell of it. So. 
Absolutely. That's wonderful. And that's a fantastic way to actually finish this wonderful, yes. wonderful Thank presentation. You. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Oh, Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, everybody, for, 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 your, for your comments and questions. They've been really, really great. So, yeah, so I, I'd love to, when, when you've got some work to show, I'd love you to actually have another spot here. That would that be, be wonderful, great. actually. Yeah. yeah, and I think the work you're doing with the studio is just brilliant, Harry. So I really appreciate you, you asking me to be a part of it. Oh, thank you so much. My pleasure. It's honoured, absolutely honoured. Okay. Right. Thank you so much. Good night. And yeah, Good we'll be in touch. All. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Bye for now. Cool. Okay, folks, that was absolutely fantastic. What an insight and, 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 and what a medley of of different styles and approaches from, if you want, the more traditional black and white landscapes to the to the abstract images and the different use of of cameras from iPhones to to high end digital equipment. So yeah, hope you enjoyed this evening, and please follow us uh, either on on, on on our YouTube channel. If you go to the website, do subscribe to the new newsletter where you'll have updates of new exhibitions and talks and different activities that are uh, that that are actually going on. And as I said earlier, if you know, if you would like to actually exhibit work. Or if you know of other people that would like to exhibit work, yeah, by all means, get in touch. We're always expanding, gradually, gradually, gradually expanding our range of provisions. Ah, a couple of questions, comments have come from Sarah. Thank you. And from Ali Holland. Thank you. Really interesting. Well, that's great. Thank you so much, folks. It's been wonderful to have you here this evening. Bye for now. See you next time. Bye.